Good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, and thanks to Peter Weibel and uh, ZKM uh, for this opportunity. <clears throat> so today I, I would like to share with you some of our recent experiments and practices. And of course, AI is something everyone is doing. It's recent, yeah, it's something new. <clears throat> in 1997, Gary Kasparov, a legendary Russian uh, grandmaster champion, and champion, he was a champion for uh, 13 years, lost a chess match to IBM supercomputer Deep Blue. Deep Blue win was something symbolically significant, a sign that artificial intelligence was catching up to human intelligence. But the story was actually more complicated. Deep Blue was not an artificial intelligence per se. It mainly relied on a brute computational force. All, uh, <clears throat> all the algorithms and strategies and historical chess matches were put into it by engineers. But the machine experienced a bug, and that was uh, interesting. The machine made a logical move. Kasparov lost his control, and actually who is uh, following uh, chess master um, championships, cha championships uh, they know that Kasparov is an incredibly passionate uh, player. His character is that he's really uh, playing very aggressive. And that time he really lost control because a uh, computer made a logical move. Actually, that illogical move was um, programmed by engineers when, when it's a bag then a computer goes not you know, attacking and not defending. It just goes a neutral step. So Kasparov lost control, and he could not figure out the reasoning behind the, unless this useless move, because there was none. The machine won because it was irrational. After this, Kasparov proposed to play in two, in teams of two. Human and machine against human and machine. So he proposed a collaboration with a computer rather in competition. And then a long other story starts. So I want to say that machine errors, glitches, are inevitable. Uh, they disorientate us as the same way as Kasparov. They knock us out of the... <clears throat> out from our day-to-day -day state, give us new emotions, and become artworks. Deep learning technologies developed by scientists and engineers challenge artists and philosophers. The technologies need, these new technologies new, need another logic. They couldn't be understood as extensions of our own bodies anymore that we used to think. Instead, they became more and more autonomous and unpredictable, just like our living creatures. We don't have strong AI yet, so it's not a secret. We don't know how the development will go. But we think the way forward is not using AI. I think, I convinced, that is not using AI as an instrument or competing with it, but in collaboration. Now we already can integrate recent technologies of low AR, of low AI, or yeah, low AI, and deep learning into artworks and collaborate with deep learning researchers. We in Laboratoria are trying to invent this new cultural logic of technology. We build a deep interaction between scientists, artists, engineers, and scholars. This, we share ideas with each other, cross-pollination between different intellectual cultures, provoke each, each of them to state and solve new unexpected problems. I won't speak long about Laboratoria, but uh, to whom we are, I mean, to who didn't know anything, I think I will present a little bit who we are and from who I am actually speaking. Laboratoria Art and Science Foundation is the first independent nonprofit research exhibition and production center in Russia, uh, focused on creating platforms of transdisciplinary interaction between contemporary art science and broader audiences. We see ourselves as a conduit for communication between artists, scientific collectives, and where technological artworks are created through the interaction of diverse intellectual cultures on equal terms. For over than more a decade, we have been developing different methods of interaction of four main actors, 
artists, scientists, engineers, philosophers, and curators, in order to maintain a mutual flow of ideas. Since the beginning, my strong belief was that large-scale interdisciplinary science art projects combining art and recent most relevant research need institutional support, a platform. And that's why in 2008, I founded in Moscow Laboratoria as a platform. Laboratoria has always provided this platform, not just an exhibition, but for production and for cultural exchange. Uh, actually, we have several methods, actually many methods, but uh, like transposition, this we worked with Marina Abramovic um, uh, for climate change studies and Arctic expedition, we use the method of third order observer. But today, I would like to speak with you with uh, the method we call infusion. This method is uh, most frequently used, and this method uh, actually we implemented uh, in collaboration with Thomas Feuerstein, who will speak after me, and we will actually present our recent project, uh, Borg and Bess. So I would like to go deeper with you to this infusion method. Uh, I would first would like to say that, of course, these all, uh, all diagrams, you know, they are simplified. Um, so here you see, here you see uh, four main actors, artists, scientists, laboratoria as an institution. It could be another institution like, I don't know, ZKM, Future Everything or whatever, different. And uh, engineers. Engineers, it's also, let's say, so-called, it's engineers. Uh, it could be also innovative uh, technological company. So I would like to point your attention that here, so it's, unfortunately, I can't run to the scheme because then it will not work. Usually, it's so nice to jump there. <laughs> I can't take it. I can. Oh, so nice. Uh, so, scientists. Uh, I will start from the left. Scientists, they give uh, to artists uh, objective knowledge. Of course, it's not only what they give, but this kind of uh, the vision, what is really happening in uh, science. Artists give them critical thinking. Uh, so, to laboratoria, scientists give relevant context, and we give, I mean, as a... Uh, support a platform institution, we give them popularization of science. Uh, this is, of course, not something, imp uh, not something very important uh, for lab, but this is a kind of a side effect. I mean, popularization. We are not a science museum, but for scientists, I would say from my uh, experience, this is very important because they, of course, they see forthcoming exhibition as something is they would show also their developments. What is their exchange between scientists and engineers? So engineers and scientists. Why I divide them? Actually, culturally in Russia, it's very stupid, but uh, fundamental research and practical implementations are divided. So that's why how we work. So scientists is the, someone who really, you know, go give ideas in their kind of fundamental research, yeah? And engineers, they give us real innovations and they give us this new, no, new language for artists. Hmm, I hope you, just a little bit, I will talk about this uh, diagram later with the examples. Also, what is not in this uh, diagram is philosophers or uh, other humanitarian scholars, which we usually also invite to all our brainstorms, and they also participate. Uh, but here, just to simplify, I didn't put it in. Uh, so also the results. You, you see from all of the actors, down goes the lines. Um, so the scientists, they make their unusual experiments. Artists, of course, artworks. Laboratoria make some exhibition, organize exhibitions, and engineers some new developments. So what's um, then for more than seven years, we've been working with the neuroscientists and deep learning researchers. 
During these years, they'd become more and more interested in AI problems as one of the newest and most prospective technologies of the time. That's why we decided to infuse artists into AI research teams. The most interesting art is often born side by side with cut, cutting edge research. And um, yeah, just for whom don't know with what we worked already, so we, before we started and worked with many other topics, uh, other different spheres of science, like astrophysics, bioengineering, quantum physics, glaciology, climate change, nanotechnology, and so on. But last two years, very logically, with the, this uh, connection with the neuroscientists, we came to deep learning technologies, deep learning research. And um, these reflections and these communications with deep learning researchers formed the idea of our exhibition called Diamonds in the Machine, held in Moscow, MoMA, in 2018. We presented there 12 projects by Russian and international artists united by image of digital diamond. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about the concept and structure of the show. Every time has its own demons, headstrong ancient Greek diamonds, ghosts, angels, and diamonds of monotheistic religions. Artificial intelligence is a diamond of immediate future. Now diamonds are referred to as a routine process of operating system. From our birth, we are included not only in the world of living creatures now, but in the world of machine as well, global technosenosis of modernity. Artists reflect upon their situation and create new myths. They speak with the visitors on the techno-language combination of technology and art. Together with the un unity of creation is born the unity of the world. A man stops being the measure of all things, the machine gets the measure diamonds, and they gradually get their autonomy in it, while art provokes a dialogue between biological and technological agents. So the participants of the Diamonds in the Machine exhibition created modern diamonds with their instruments, rethink, criticize, teach them, foster dialogue with them. The system of weak artificial intelligence become also an art form. We distinguish three main methods uh, used by artists. I have given them working titles. So the first is mythologization. What is mythologization? Uh, today, our magical thinking is directed to digital process that became second nature of the human being. We animate them, uh, fill them with hyper expectation and hyper fears, try to define with the help of new myths. The artist seeks for new language to cast spell of new diamonds or talk with them in the new language, machines, neural networks, and electrical circuits. Artists using this method was Where Dogs Run, it's a Russian group, uh, which uh, we commissioned a new project this you see now um, on the slides. Uh, it was a three-part project, uh, the day after tomorrow. Actually, here, the artists, they produced a myth on the basis of Dante Alighieri Divine Comedy. So here, you can see in these electric circuits, it was um, the whole Divine Comedy, uh, so they transferred it into the another language. And the second room uh, was also, I would not speak really too much about this work because otherwise we'll not get to the topic of what I want to say. So this was, okay, briefly, Dante Alighieri, they transformed and here you also see smaller uh, real chickens. These chickens, they gave us signals and the signal was transferred for the mining of uh, blockchain, and here was also low-tech technology, screens was also co connected to divine comedy, comedy and these small living chickens. So this is about mythologization. Eric Matrai also, uh, so he's mytholo mythologization. 
giving myths to his work, Jelena Nicanole, and Thomas Feuerstein. He also made a new project for this show, and it was, it was born during the communication with Russian scientists and with Russian context. Uh, the project was a three-part also project, T for Kirillov. One of the parts is Borgian Bess, which we will talk much more today later. The second group of the works was I unite in so-called uh, name, I call it technosenosis. Technosenosis, this concept was developed by Russian engineer Boris Kudrin in late 60s. He defined it as a relatively autonomous system of technical objects which can be studied by methods of biology, analogically to bio biocenosis. Dmitry Kovarga, John McCormack and Ftol create technocenosis, autonomous communities of integral system. These works live in their own world. The human presence is not ob obliging, obliging. Absorbing concepts, that's what you see on the slide now, by Dmitry Kovarga, transform philosophical texts into abstract drawings. Robert Painters, here, by John McCormack, build their ecosystem and try to make arrangements to survive together. And Ftol, here, also a new work made specially for exhibition commissioned by Laboratoria. Here, this work called Umbilical Digital. This is like a cyber mother uh, who preoccupied with surviving of her forstellings, Tamagotchi toys. And you see that what she is printing, or it is printing now, uh, it is uh, like every uh, step of what she does for Tamagotchi, for her babies, uh, like uh, washing them, feeding them, or if someone ill, she is registering it, registering. And no Tamagotchi is dying, never forget to do something. So, the third, third, part of the show, I, call, so I give a, a name, auto-evolution. This third method we decide yeah, to call auto-evolution. Rosie Braidotti, one of the main post-humanist theoreticians, argues that Zoe, a vital life force, is peculiar both for men and other types of matter, including technical objects. Artificial intelligence appears as a post-human subject that consists of mechanic and digital elements. They communicate with the human world on their own. So here, we have uh, in this group also three works. One of them, Memo Acton, and uh, he, the, the work is uh, Learning to See. To works here, they try to recognize and remember the visitors at the exhibition. Uh, I'll just briefly, briefly explain. Of course, it's much more to say about each of the work. Uh, the second work is by Igor Kraft. These uh, neural networks invent intricate substitutes for lost fragments in ancient Greek statues. And Justine Mar work, it's a video work with a dance of robot and Moriyama dancer learned dancing and human speech, the robot learned. It. And the last part of the exhibition was an, we call it incubator. Uh, art science in incubator section, section uh, dips us into the process of interaction of scientists and artists, and here were a lot of documentations of uh, meetings and also the conference we did before the show. Um, and also you see actually the same uh, diagram I showed you and some others, it's so we also wanted to show the visitors in the museum how some, some of these works appear, so how we work with the artists and scientists. So I really wanted to give uh, audience this touch of the process and to involve them. And here we are, one of the projects which is, uh, let's say, 
especially dear for me because it was actually running, it was a long-term project which was for two years development, which is Borgian Bess. So. Long-term collaborative project between artists, robotic engineers, deep learning researchers. Artist is Thomas Feuerstein and uh, all the scientists, software engineers, uh, voice recording engineers and so on, uh, Russians. Um, so, it was developed in collaboration, I should say these names, uh, Mikhail Burtsev, PhD, and his colleagues in deep learning research in his institution, I. Pavlov Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, Valery Karpov, and his robotic team and National Research Center, Compu Kurchatov Institute. So the project, as you understand, was premiered in Moscow MoMA, and today, actually, it's so funny, it's so nice that it's two last days of the show, this project, Okay. Is. This is, uh, uh, it's now in the show in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, uh, the exhibition called Cybernetic Consciousness, Quantum Horizon. And um, actually, I won't take from Thomas a chance to go into the detail of the concept of this amazing project and his philosophy, I would like to concentrate on the story of this collaborative work and practices behind the project that was developed for two years. Borgin Bess at Digital Diamonds animated by data processes to point to the near future where we will not just communicate with artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence will communicate to each other. Uh, they are not human oriented helpers or quasi autonomous entities they don 't be um, so they don 't be assimilated into the human society as we can enjoy their communication with each other. So the story started in two thousand and sixteen. We have invited Thomas to Moscow and introduced him to the number of laboratory long term partners Burtsev uh, and so on and other leading researchers uh, in Russia work in machine learning, neurolinguistic philosophers who study consciousness and free will. Um, our common goal uh, from the beginning was to produce a large-scale project in collaboration with three researchers. <laughs> Actually, here also Thomas is trying uh, one of the um, uh, latest experiment on himself of a free will. This is a, yeah, was a very freaky lab. Maybe, Thomas, you will speak about this. Uh, yeah, maybe, a free will lab. Uh, so, then it was a series of a brainstorming, brainstorms. So, Thomas got into the contact with uh, these four research teams, discussed their ideas, and in a month, he came back to us with a sketch of art project involving all the scientific fields he'd been exposed to. Uh, he was inspired by Russian context and challenges faced by machine learning experts. After half a year, he, we invited Thomas again to come. This is, was in 2017. And uh, we hold a series of brainstorming sessions with philosophers, neurolinguists, and new visits, so new visits to leading neuroscience um, departments, deep learning departments. Uh, also, already we started to discuss uh, production of a new project. So actually, I would like to show here a video before we are going to some conclusions of how this collaboration was, uh, what this collaboration was giving something to scientists, because to artists we actually understand what it's giving, but it's also for me always very important, uh, and I feel uh, kind of a responsible also to the, for the scientists and engineers who work with us, so that for them it's also not only, you know, a technical order to, to do something, but it's also a collaboration and they find their own interest in it. So I would like to show this video 
uh, because here will be really nice diagrams of the scientists who are saying what, it, what kind of science in these kind of creepy surgical lamps. Maybe I will just cut a little bit of the video of what was already repeated. We need sound. This is in our production studio. These creepy cyberpunk robots take actual headlines from online Russian media and with the help of artificial neural network, discuss them by whispering in the archaic language of 19th century literature. Two surgery lamps were transformed into the robotic cyber creatures Borgi from Cyborg and Bess from Dostoevsky's novel Demons, Bess in Russian. Borgi and Bess studies the post-human world of near future where machines can communicate with each other and they do not longer need humans around. Do humans have free will? This is one of the eternal philosophical and scientific questions. And what about non-humans? Do complex, constantly evolving artificial neural network have their own free will? So this book is about demons and um, most people have religious meanings in mind if they heard the word demon. But this, I think, is a restricted interpretation. Demons has a broader meaning, yeah? because demons we find everywhere, also in science. We have the Maxwell demon, the Laplace demon, the Darwinian demon and so on. Demons are haunting us everywhere because they live in computer systems. Yeah? Demons are all autonomous processes uh, in the internet, on servers and so on, also on our smartphones. And demons in future will maybe have uh, a more and more autonomous behavior, more and more rights to act, yeah? uh, and maybe in future time they have a, a consciousness, something we call artificial intelligence. Borgian Best Project was born in Moscow in Laboratoria Art and Science. In 2016, we invited Thomas what Borgian Best had taught the machines to maintain a dialogue and analyze the tone of the message. Robotic engineers created a motional behavior control system, so Borgi and Bess changed their movements according to the emotional hue of the news. This is a diagram of Borgi and Bess' AI brain. Let's start with the part which generate discussion of contemporary news in the 19th century language. News headlines are retrieved from the news server. Convolutional neural network predicts sentiment for every headline, how positive or negative it is. Sentiment signal is sent to animate movements of lamps. Then we generate dialogue about news headlines with recurrent neural network, pre-trained as a language model on texts from 19th century. The model predicts how discussion of the modern news should look like 200 years ago. Predicted dialogue scripts are sent to speech servers to animate Borgin Bass with alien whisper voices. Next diagram this from is robotics. the architecture of emotional behavior control system of Borgian Bess. The behavior really of the system is determined by its it. needs in communication, curiosity, rest, and safety. The system can sense boredom, sound, obstacle, fatigue, and danger. The gates simulates the emotional part, which is responsible for stabilizing the movement. When the system receives a sentiment of its own message, a certain behavioral reaction is activated. If the sentiment is very negative, the system changes its behavior dramatically. Thus, the system demonstrates understanding and action as a living entity. Borgin Bess are questioning and interpreting human information in order to make sense of the world. They look at human culture from a distance and study the world like aliens, showing their desire for free will. The surgery lamps illuminate not the physical body on the surgery Okay, just uh, these two diagrams were very important to show to you because they are really, uh, it's a lot of sense in them. So it's important that uh, first of all, it's, they don't randomly move. You surely understand that they don't react on people. They react on uh, emotional hue on the news. So if the news coming, all news are coming actually from Russia, 
and uh, they try to speak about this news in ancient language of Dostoevsky. And which is interesting that sometimes we think they give us bugs and strange uh, words, but then when we check it in the dictionary, we understand that these words really exist, but they are just ancient, well, I mean, not ancient, but 200 years ago used words. So it's really a lot of uh, interesting in this uh, project, uh, according, to, uh -oh, according to science. And I need to finish soon. I want to say that this collaboration and also why it was important also to deep learning engineers, because while we were developing this project, actually, it was not so smooth smooth. Uh, to combine all diverse parts, and you understand it was many participants of the installation, so, so it was voice, movement, artificial brain, artistic vision, across disciplinary and also national borders, uh, it was quite difficult than expected. So to mobilize the team, I proposed to do a public show, a public test show. Uh, with our partner, higher, uh, British Higher School of Art and Design. So we organized this public demonstration and also a conference, uh, Demons in the Machine Anticipating Artificial Intelligence. Here all participants and expert, expert met and discussed the problems and perspectives. And uh, the test demonstration and the conference actually served a necessary reflecting step to move the project forward. Beforehand, it was really, really difficult to synchronize them. And uh, one of the main problem was to synchronize the work of deep learning researchers and robotic, robotic engineers. And uh, actually, I would say that the main motivation for them to work, uh, I mean, never finance, for them was uh, always a motivation to hold an unusual experiment. And when every time Thomas was coming to Moscow, that was a motivation for them, uh, you know, to do something and to progress. Because when he was leaving, they immediately said, okay, we are doing, but actually nothing was in progress. So I did this kind of uh, a little bit uh, foxy things to organize different meetings and public meetings where it was necessary for them to show some, let's say, progress. Otherwise, the progress was not coming. Um, so I want just, uh, I, I know that I have very uh, little time and thank you for your patience. And sorry for my so-so <laughs> English. So I wanted to, to tell also something from uh, our also uh, very important partner from this project, which is Mikhail Bursov. He is here now on the slide. And, um, you know, many journalists were asking him also during this test uh, show uh, why you are collaborating with artists. What for? You know, this is one of the most of course, frequent and a little bit annoying question for us. And uh, scientists usually say they don't want really to, go, to be serious and to go deep in this question. They say, we do it for fun. You know, we like it, we do it for fun. But seriously, when, uh, I mean, we speak, uh, uh, they reply in another way. And I want to tell you what they reply. Uh, actually, also, we collaborate with many scientists and I would say also very famous scientists who, whose schedule is so packed, they don't have any hour. They, they give time for artists. And even, you know, if they say, we do it for fun, they don't do it only for fun. <laughs> Uh, so, why, why they do it? Um, it's difficult to say, but I would say that the results, they are seen in a long-term perspective. Because um, uh, this kind of freedom they receive on art territory to prove their, let's say, a little bit mm, uh, kind of... Uh, smelly, smelly? B uh, brave hypothesis. Uh, they can do it with artists and of course to open up a little bit the visions and you know 
to get out of this uh, closed box and whatever. And again, what Burtsev said when we were speaking, and I said, Misha, please tell me, but I know that it's so difficult for you to give us such, so much time these days. Why you are doing it? And he was telling me, you know, that in this project, Borgin Bess, uh, what we do, we make this neural network, um, we teach neural network to stylish, to stylish, you know, yeah, to make the language of 19th century with Dostoevsky. Anyway, we would do this kind of experiment because this is not so practical for us, but it's interesting. And what's, what's important that we use unusual model because here we, we have a freedom to experiment. Actually, what kind of model they used for us. For this artwork, we use so-called language model, a model of, uh, that can predict sequences. It means that we do not teach our net neural network any particular language. We don't put any dictionaries, which they usually do. We just tell in the language is a sequence of signs, and the network has to learn and predict the next sign. And actually, he said that this kind of strategy will give much more mistakes than another one, the classical way of doing it. But this is much more interesting for them to experiment in this way and to see what will happen. And actually, this project also is very important that even nowadays, uh, the neural network is studying and continuing to study. In Moscow, it was uh, more or less like a child, uh, three years old, could not make long sentences. Uh, in Brazil, it was much more clever, let's say, and uh, that's it. So, uh, the last words. My, the, the question of AI leads us to the question of what is human intelligence and consciousness actually are. Can recent experiments in AI-driven art and machine learning encourage us to return to bigger questions, such as what is art today and what is art today for? Borgin Bess is a vivid example of this transdisciplinary strategy, uniting artists and cutting-edge researchers whose collaboration became beneficial for both sides. Artists and developers developing new languages and mediums, while scientists and engineers discover and study new problems coming from logic of another cultural context. We can view AI differently. Some can be fascinated by new possibilities of new worlds, while others are critical on technologies and emphasize threats that uh, those could bear. But anyway, our methodology of collaborative practices help us to anticipate the world of coming AI. Thank you very much for your attention. And if I was not clear in some of my ideas, I would be happy to explain uh, after the talk somewhere. Thank you.